so often we we question what am I supposed to be doing? So we find careers or we find hobbies, we find things that we can give back to the world or contribute that are adjacent, like are close. We and, and I think a lot of times, I mean, listen, we're one of those really, really lucky people who are like, at three years old, I picked up a drumstick and, you know, like an actual drum, not chicken, but like <laughs> I picked up a drumstick and I never turned back, right? Now I'm a drummer. <laughs> or maybe you picked up a chicken drumstick and you knew your your purpose in life. I don't know. Colonel but, Sanders. That's right. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. Have you ever had a time in your life, I've had this time, where you were doing something that enlivened you to such degree that you were losing track of time, you had full engagement around this activity or this thing you were doing, and afterward, you felt a sense of, of power and possibility and alignment like absolute alignment from your entire emotions, mindset, physicality, everything. I've had a lot of these moments. One of the reasons why I love to run live events here at Personality Hacker is because when we're running an event with people and we're teaching and we've got a big group, a big audience there, we're engaged with them with personal growth content, having fun around it, teaching, connecting, sharing ideas. I lose track of all the time in the world. Like I, I don't care about anything that's going on in the world, like all the problems fade in the background because I can feel myself on my purpose, passion, and mission. And it's such an amazing feeling. Mm. So we're talking about this on the show today, personality types and finding flow. This idea of getting into a flow state, something that you do that you are lit up around. And I'm sure you have this. If you're listening right now, I'm sure you've got one of these in your life or many of these types of things. But we want to talk today about putting some nuance and distinction and definition around this that you could apply to your own specific personality type. Yeah, I I think, you know, we we used to actually talk about the concept of flow a lot in the early days of the podcast. Yeah. And maybe it's because I thought it was a well-established concept that we haven't really revisited it. But in you and I are producing some content for uh, our owner's manuals which are type specific and dive into how each personality type engages with their cognitive functions and some principles that they can pull from and and techniques and strategies to make the most of their understanding of their type. And as we were creating the content around finding flow, because we think that that's important that each person be able to understand what puts them into a flow state, I realized that, at least for me, I'm coming at it from a slightly different position than I had originally. So, I, I mean, we might not have really recorded a podcast on flow for like quite a few years, <laughs> like maybe over five. And in that time period, we've done so much more coaching, we've done so much more um, content generation. And I realized that I think that there's actually two different levels to this. Yeah. And you touched on one of them, which is this idea of everything feels lit up. But I think what I'd like to do in this episode or uh, today is first talk about the principles of flow in case a person isn't familiar with that concept. I mean, I think we all have like a little bit of familiarity with the idea of being in a flow state, but there are certain characteristics that define flow. And then two different layers of using your personality type as an access point for understanding your personal flow states. Now, the premise I think we're coming from is that this is not a perma state of being in flow. It is something that we enter into, we spend some time there, and then we leave and we come back to, quote unquote, the real world. But I think it is something that we can grow the time around. In other words, we can develop and build and create a life for ourselves that ergonomically with our personality type, puts us in the best position to be in a flow state as much as possible. Mm. That's our belief. And that's what we talk about with personality types is this notion that if you create a world around you that serves who you are and how you're wired, there's going to be a lot of engagement in your life. You're going to feel a sense of purpose. You're going to feel a sense of passion, attunement, satisfaction, not only with yourself, but with the teams you work with, the people you engage with, and all the things that you do. So, this is, uh, I think this is an important conversation because this is something we want to encourage you listening right now to move toward in your life. Well, and a lot of times when people experience flow, it's almost like it happened to them. Hmm. Like they realize that in retrospect. 
But if you have a formula for what puts you into a flow state, now when you are feeling down or you, you are lacking energy, you feel like there's some nutrient missing in your soul, flow is a way to get a meal, right? It's, it's intentionally generative to more than just your body or your mind. It's, it's like the, it, it feeds the whole package. So not just going, oh, that put me into flow. That's interesting. And not, and not really being sure why and then not being able to replicate it. We're trying going the opposite direction, which is I know that these kinds of things put me in flow and I know why. And so when I need a flow state, I can go do these things. So we're using the term flow in the same way that Mihai Csikszentmihalyi in his book, Finding Flow. Uh, or is it Finding Flow or is it just flow? <laughs> flow is his original book. I think he's got a second one, a shorter one right. about how to find flow. Right. The first one is just flow though. And he used eight different characteristics that define a flow state. So uh, the eight characteristics are clarity of goals and immediate feedback, a high level of concentration on a limited field, balance between skills and challenge, the feeling of control, effortlessness, an altered perception of time, the melting together of action and consciousness, and this concept of intrinsic reward, which is that the activity itself is rewarding to us. So a couple different things that most people you know, register when they're in a flow state are things like they lose track of time, right? They're like, oh, it felt like it was five minutes, but it was actually two hours. So that's a really important component to it. And then that idea of skill matching challenge. If we do something that is too easy, it doesn't put us into a flow state because we don't have to focus on it. It's, you know, it's like, oh, that's, that's, that's too simple. But if it's so difficult, it's outside of our reach, that's not going to put us in flow either because now it's, it's almost frustrating. Our, in our attempt to do this thing, we can't do it. Maybe we're failing over and over that's not going to put us in flow either. So finding things that match our current skill development with the challenge is really an important component. And that's why sometimes flow states change over time. What was once challenging to us at an earlier level of development is no longer challenging. So flow itself will also continue to change and evolve. And our relationship to it is going to change and evolve over time as well. So think back a time in your life, maybe recently, maybe in the past, some of these things we just talked about, these definitions of flow, can you identify a moment when you had a lot of these light up, maybe all of them, when they were in alignment, they were activated for you? That's probably a, a flow period of your life or a, a moment you were in flow in your life. So just see if you could maybe, as we're talking about this in conversing, just see if you could identify moments in your life you've had this happen to you. Hmm. Yeah. So using type as an access point for this, I'm going to, I'm going to dive into cognitive functions. Now, uh, not necessarily the specific function, but more the position of the function. So we use the car model a lot of times when people are just first understanding cognitive functions, it's a nice metaphor as an access point. So we use the dominant cognitive function, the mental process that is the most influential for our personality type, we call that the driver. And then the second function, which is technically called the auxiliary function, we call it the co-pilot. The third function, which is technically called the tertiary, we refer to that as a 10-year-old. And then the fourth function, which is our inferior, we call that the three-year-old. And there are eight cognitive functions in total, but four of them are what Dr. John Beebe would call egocentonic, meaning that they're the ones that our egos identify with. We, we see them inside of ourselves. We, we kind of know that that's, that's how we operate. Whether it's a strength or a weakness, we own it, right? That's, that's kind of how I work. The last four functions, which are sometimes referred to as the shadow functions, are ego dystonic. So we don't really identify with them as much. As we use this model as an access point for flow, I do want to make it clear, though, that I'm not saying, or we're not saying, that a person cannot be in a flow state in any function that isn't their first four. You can be in flow incidentally in any function or maybe even things that we would see outside of the functions. So we're not limiting your flow state to these four egocentonic functions, but they're a great access point for trying to define the kinds of things that put us in flow and understand why something does, right? How are they, how are these functions responding and reacting can sometimes enlighten or illuminate why this is a flow state at all. If you'd like a quick handy guide 
to understand more about the car model that Antonia just talked about. You can find that over for free over at personalityhacker.com forward slash car model. And you can find out more about what she's talking about to follow along. Yeah. So there's two different levels or layers to this I've realized. And I think in the past, my thought process was, well, anything that is, you know, satisfying these eight criteria and is using your driver or your dominant function, that's going to put you in flow. Or uh, anything that combines your driver and your co-pilot. But in ProFlyer training, we teach people to ask the question when they begin their interview with somebody who is trying to find their best fit type in a profiling session. We teach them to ask what we call as the flow question. And the flow question goes like this. What do you love to do? What do you love to do so much? The only reason you stop is because you're exhausted. Otherwise, you go on indefinitely. Now, if it was only the driver function that was getting into flow or the co-pilot, you would consistently see people answer activities that call upon those two functions. But for the last 10 years, I've heard people talk about activities that call on all four of their quote unquote egocentric functions. So that means that we can get into flow beyond just our first two preferred functions. All four of those functions oftentimes come in. So that was very interesting. That was a piece of information that in the early days I didn't really acknowledge. The other part is that I've realized that there is there are flow states, again, using type as access, there are flow states that isolate or silo each of the functions. And then there are flow states that include all of them together. And those are two, those are a little different from each other. There are flow states that isolate each function and those are really important to find. And I'll explain why in a second. But that basically means that somebody like me with ENTP preferences, there are activities where my extroverted feeling or harmony, 10-year-old or tertiary function, it's just that's in flow. Like it's not really satisfying the other parts of me. It's just I'm in a vibe with somebody. I'm connecting with them. I really feel good about this interplay and this interaction. And the other functions aren't really getting involved. I mean, maybe it's like a time period where I'm dancing. I'm dancing in the middle of a group of people. We're not communicating. We're not articulating. We're not passing along concepts or ideas. We're not brainstorming or idea generating. I'm not doing anything new, right? I'm just in a vibe with other human beings. And I can get into flow doing that. Just being in the, the center of that activity, the energy of other people. That would be an isolated experience of flow for my 10-year-old or tertiary function. But I can also get into flow when all of my functions are being used. So there's advantages to understanding that idea in order to get to that, that concept of the, what I'm calling the holistic flow state. The holistic flow state being that all four of my cognitive functions are lighting up in that moment. But it takes a bit of a, it's a, bit of a dance to get there because that single activity is going to have to meet each one of those functions at the level of that function, meaning that not all four of my functions are at the same level of development. And if flow requires skill and challenge to be in an approximate state, that means that the activity is going to have to meet my dominant or driver function at its level of sophistication. It's going to have to challenge that function while at the same time meeting my 10-year-old or tertiary extroverted feeling of harmony at its level of sophistication. And those are not the same. Those yeah. are stratified. I have, a, I mean, the, the example of doing live events at Personality Hacker speaks to this because I believe that all four of my cognitive functions with ENFP preferences are lit up during, for example, our five-day profile training event. We have to teach and adapt content in real time and come up with ideas on the fly to help people understand the material. Now, we've got a, a process we follow, but there's a lot of things that come up incidentally in the moment. And we're also managing multiple different classes running, right? So we're in charge of the entire event. We're teaching on the main stage, but there's multiple rooms with advanced classes happening as well. So the ideas that all cross-pollinate, there's things that present themselves opportunistically. And then my introverted feeling co-pilot auxiliary function gets involved in guiding and leading the emotional tone and helping set the emotional tone and the energy of the room and the entire event. My extroverted thinking effectiveness process, 10-year-old or tertiary, lights up because it's such a short timeline of five days. 
it's about the sophistication that my, you know, effectiveness can handle and I can execute on those five days. So it feels really honored and it can see instant feedback and results from what it's doing, the impact. And then my introverted sensing or memory process at the three-year-old or inferior level knows that we're creating a legacy. We're laying down tracks for the future and we're setting up a system, something that will hopefully stand the test of time, the content that we put out, the people that we train and connect with, all of this. So at a live event, I believe that all four of my functions in my car model are activated and lightened, you know, light, lighting up. They're lighting up all over the place for me to be able to bring my best self in there. And that's why I think it's part of my passion, purpose, and mission, because I feel like that is all engaged at the same time. Yeah. And when a person is experiencing holistic flow, it's been my impression that the that that's when they say, this is what I was meant to do. Yeah. This is what I was put on the planet to do. And th- I, so often we we question, what am I supposed to be doing? So we find careers or we find hobbies. We find things that we can give back to the world or contribute that are adjacent, like are close. We And, and I think a lot of times, I mean, unless you're one of those really, really lucky people who are like, at three years old, I picked up a drumstick and, you know, like an actual drum, not chicken, but like <laughs> I picked up a drumstick and I never turned back, right? Now I'm a drummer. <laughs> or maybe you picked up a chicken drumstick and you knew your your purpose in life. I don't know. Colonel but, Sanders. That's right. <laughs> that said, it's it's like I, I knew what I wanted to do it by the by the time I was three. And that person's really lucky. But most people are like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Maybe maybe I don't know because it's it's raising a family, right? And that's not something you do at three years old. But there's this there's a lot of times just trying to kind of navigate towards what is it that I'm really here to do and contribute. I've been using this word stewardship a lot as well. What am I, what am I here to steward? Uh, what aspect of life? What are the, what is the thing I'm here to provide? What do I remind the world of that it's forgotten? Or what do I teach it that it never knew? And those moments when all of your egocentric functions are lit up, Almost always that's a moment of like that. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. So I want to talk about the value first, though, of siloing each of your functions and figuring out their flow state. And I think one of the things to acknowledge is that when you're matching skill with challenge, and I know there's this idea in some type communities that you can be just as good at your you know, your third and fourth function as you can be at your first and second. I've seen some people indicate that. But I think... This goes back to that, the idea of certainty. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've done podcasts on personality types and certainty or uncertainty. I think the one thing that we never let go of when it comes to our third and fourth functions is at least with our third or tertiary or 10 year old function, there's always going to be this like l- this niggling doubt of uncertainty. And then on our fourth function or our inferior, what we call the three year old, there's always going to be deep uncertainty. Well, that means that when we're doing an activity that lights these parts of us up, even if we have developed enough skill, maybe we have developed because we've been trying to get over the sense of uncertainty. So we've been developing a bunch of talents and, or a bunch of skills and, and competencies and capacities and tapping into tools that help you know become better at whatever that is. We never let go of the sense of uncertainty. So the things that put us into flow with those functions are the things that for a moment, they, they quiet that question. They are at a skill level where we go, okay, I can handle this. This is something that's not out so far out of my capacity that I'm amp, uh, that, that sense of uncertainty is getting even more amped up. And that's important. So, so with our driver dominant function, we almost always feel a bit overconfident. This is, you know, what John B. would call it our hero function. And it's like the right tool for all the jobs. And so things that challenge that first function is going to have to be something that our sense of overconfidence doesn't believe is too simple for us. It's going to have to be enough of a challenge that that part goes, ooh, like I'm actually, I'm not bored. This is actually challenging this part of who I am. And it's meeting what I believe is a lifetime of, ta- uh, well, first a, a talent, but a lifetime of skill development. It's meeting that idea of, I, 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 I should be good at this no matter what the situation is. So something that really throws you into the deep end when it comes to this function, that's 
oftentimes what makes people feel like, okay, that's a sufficient amount of challenge for my, for my first function. And a lot of times when people are bored with life or kind of dysthymic or, you know, unsure of whether or not this is a thing for them, it's not enough challenge for that function. So it has to, the, the activities that put you into flow have to be truly at that level. When it comes to the co-pilot or the auxiliary function, John calls this a, 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 the archetypal energy is apparent. So I've noticed that what puts us into flow for this function is not only sufficient challenge, but also a sense of helping others. It's contribution. With our first function, it's like that piece isn't as necessary in order to feel good. It just has to, it has to work. For the second function, it has to feel like we're serving somebody else. We're parenting them in some way. We're sharing insight and wisdom. We're helping guide their decisions in life. That's usually what makes us feel good in that function. So it's not just challenge. It's also contribution plus challenge. That's usually what puts somebody into a flow state with that second function. With the 10-year-old or tertiary, that third function, this tends to have an overcompensating nature because it's the first time we feel uncertainty. Our first two functions don't really feel uncertainty as much. Our first function doesn't feel any uncertainty. In fact, it, sometimes it should feel more uncertain and it doesn't. The second function is a little bit more modest, but it's usually looking for enough feedback to go, okay, I'm on the right path. I'm not uncertain, but I'm going to get feedback from the outside world to indicate like, yeah, this is, this is the right advice or I'm modeling the right behavior. When you get to the third function, that's when you feel uncertain, but John would call it an eternal child and the business of children is to be loved. And so it's seeking approval. It doesn't want to reveal the fact that it's not as good as it could be, or it's uncertain about how good it actually is. And so that overcompensating nature means that when it comes to that function, we have a tendency to kind of bite off more than we can chew because we're trying to prove ourselves there. We're trying to prove to the world that we're good at this thing to get the approval and the head pats. So we tend to... Well, we go one of two ways here. We tend to choose activities that are too stressful for this function to really be in flow. Or the other side of it is that we ignore it altogether. We don't want to feel that sense of uncertainty, so we just kind of push it away. This is most, I think this is most often seen when a feeling function is that third function. Mm. I mean, probably actually it's seen when other functions are there. But when, you know, like an ITJ type might have introverted feeling or authenticity as this function and they pretend like they don't have emotions (laughs) or that it doesn't matter to them, that's them pushing this away. Or they're trying to show up with all of this emotional sophistication. Like they have really super high emotional intelligence because they've worked on that and then they bite off too much. Yeah. So the important thing with this function when you're looking for flow is to is to find something that's actually at not just its skill development, but also at its comfort level in, in uncertainty. Does mm. that make sense? Absolutely. I, the word idealistic comes up here because like the example of an ITJ that pushes it away is idealistic that they don't need to get emotional sophistication at all. They're just like, I don't need to worry about that in, in any way. But one that, but an INTJ or IS. Uh, ITJ, either one, right. that brings it in and amplifies it too much and overvalues it or believes it's the right tool for the job might have an idealistic view of it as well. Mm-hmm. So I think the idealism, and this is how it works for me, I think it works for you that way, it's like this this threshold. It's hard to know what the right balance is because I think the idealism gets in here so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With a three-year-old function, the inferior, John would call this the anima or the animus. Usually, this function goes into flow when it's satisfied, but it's not pushing it too hard. So what we're mostly looking for in activities here is where it feels paid attention to at all, because we really do have a tendency, since this is a place of deep uncertainty, and it never gets any better. We're not even trying to overcompensate with it. We're just deeply uncertain in this place. So we very much tend to push this part of who we are away. That's why um, a lot of Jungian uh, psychoanalysts call this the beginning of the shadow is because it's the first place where we really tend to 
all the content that lives in here for us, we don't really want to look at it and we, we make it unconscious for ourselves. Even though this is still an egocentric part, we still identify with the part of us, but we don't want to see the content that lives in there. So oftentimes when we go into flow state, it's a very gentle activity for this function. Like for introverted sensing or memory as my, you know, th three-year-old inferior animus function, it's usually very passive. It's yeah. like I'm in a comfort place. I feel safe. Uh, I, uh, I might be watching a lot of content on Netflix. It's, it's a kind of a passively entertaining place. Uh, I might just kind of, I, I might feel like I just need, I need a moment to not feel like I have to figure everything out moment to moment. I just feel like, you know, I'm, I'm rooted. I'm in my, I'm in my comfort zone. Everything is okay. I've created homeostasis. It's all going to be fine. I can't have too many of those moments. That won't be flow for me either. But when I experience that, that is generally flow for me. Yeah. And all types have this. INJs, extroverted sensing or sensation inferior, maybe a long bike ride or walking on a treadmill. Uh, something like this could possibly put somebody into a flow state. It's a low impact activity that's repetitive, you know, for those types. I think of IFPs, maybe doing a strategy turn-based game of some sort might be a flow state for extroverted thinking or effectiveness inferior. I could go down the list, but basically each one of these personality types has something that will put this inferior or three-year-old into a low impact, low stakes environment that can feel like flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it's finally getting some attention. So just the fact that it's getting attention feels like flow for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it can't be too strenuous. It can't like the weight can't be too much for it. And so it's really, I think, critical for a person to find these siloed incidental experiences of flow for each of the functions. Because sometimes we don't even acknowledge that muscle in us, even though it is quote unquote egocentric, we identify that that, yeah, that's a part of us. It doesn't mean that we're paying attention to it. It doesn't mean that we are being intentional. It doesn't mean that we are integrating it into our lives. And it's very easy when we experience something that we know is bringing a sense of uncertainty and that we are not naturally good at. Like it's, it's seasoning or peppering our personality, but we're not like naturally amazing at this thing. Hmm. It's very easy to marginalize it, to say it's not important, it's for other people, to outsource it, you know, to just kind of go like, that's not a thing for me. But we need to do that. We need to find flow states for each of these functions so that we know what it feels like at all. Like we know what a flow state in that part of us feels like, almost like identifying a muscle. Yeah. So I think a really great activity for you listening right now is to know what activities put each one of your top four cognitive functions into a flow state. So you might want to sit down, identify those four cognitive functions and their positions and say, okay, my, my dominant or driver position, what are five things that I know of or that I speculate would put me into a flow state around that function, around that positional function. And go through the entire car model, co-pilot auxiliary, 10-year-old or tertiary, inferior three-year-old. And then that list, now you have an intentionality. It's no longer just incidental. You can start to, with intention, find the things and activities that put you there and exercise those muscles, like you said, Antonia, which now, if you can weave all that together in certain activities, it can hit all of those channels now I think you're lit up to your passion, purpose, and mission in life. Mm, yeah. Well, and and sometimes the thing we're missing, the reason why we feel low energy or we feel dysthymic is that we're, we're seeking flow states for some of these functions, but ignoring the other ones. And so we kind of feel like something's missing. Hmm. You know, there's just like this sense of like, oh, I don't feel complete somehow. And so identifying activities and it's going to be different for different people. I mean, for the same personality type. Not everybody's flow state with introverted feeling, even if they're both IFP types, is going to be the same. Because introverted yeah. feeling or authenticity is such an enormous slice of life. It's such a big topic. So it will be different for each individual. But knowing what they are for you is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So when a person can identify now what it feels like to be in flow and the kinds of activities that put them in flow for you know each of these parts siloed or isolated. Then you can start to identify activities that put you in what I'm calling the holistic sense of flow, which is all of the channels are lighting up simultaneously. 
And you talked about being um, in flow at the live events, right? Mm -hmm. All of your channels are lit up. Your extroverted intuition, that driver function, that hero gets to come through and improvise and brainstorm with other people and be in the moment and feel, you know, channel or whatever it's doing. Your introverted feeling or authenticity, my observation has been that you hold a lot of emotional space for the room and you also get to be very inspiring. And that's like a parent energy for that part of who you are. You get to parent other people through inspiration and lighting up their emotions and doing a little bit of crowd control not just in commanding, but also in holding an energetic space for the room. And then your extroverted thinking or effectiveness, like you said, it's a short enough timeline where you don't have to create like this really complex system that everybody has to match to, but there's a five day system that everybody has to match to. And you can, uh, that's part of the crowd control piece as well. You're like those two functions, those, that polarity are in concert with each other, creating that environment and experience. And then finally, like you mentioned, your introverted sensing or memory is being honored. It's not being pulled on too much. We've done this multiple times. So we do pull on some precedent, but it's satisfied because it thinks it's laying tracks for something that has some permanence to it, right? It feels rooted. It feels like it's every six months. So it feels cyclical. It's a seasonal thing. And people really uh, go away with something like souvenirs from this trip, of understanding and growth and development and you feel like you're kind of leaving a mark somehow something that will last and again it's seasonal so it's a rhythm that we're in so it's not pulling too much in your introverted sensing but it's satisfying that part of your that part of you its needs so uh, i would say that coaching is that for me yeah particularly psycho spiritual style coaching i feel like i get a channel from the universe right? My extroverted intuition gets to brainstorm with another person about what's going on for them. I feel like my introverted thinking or accuracy gets to really penetrate their thoughts and listen and track for what's going on and they clarify their minds and their thoughts. I feel like my extroverted feeling or my harmony gets to be in simpatico with another person, cooperating with them to get a need met, right? And I feel like my introverted sensing or memory also feels the same sense of like, yeah, I'm doing the thing that... I'm laying tracks, right? I'm like, I'm, I'm doing the thing that will ground me and root me in the thing I was supposed to do. Like, I feel like this is, this is something I'm supposed to be repeating and refining and getting better at. And then when I look back on my experience in coaching, like, I'm like, yeah, that's, that, that, that all feels like it's right, right? That's the track I want to lay. When I'm, when I'm in the future, I want to look back and watch me doing this and know that I lived my life well so I'm, that part of me is being honored i don't pull too much i don't pull too hard on it but i'm honoring that part and again when you find that holistic sense of flow oftentimes you find purpose and that's that is a tough formula to locate now there's lots of different formulas for purpose but i do suspect that finding flow in each of your egocentric functions and then finding a holistic sense of flow I think that is one of the styles or one of the algorithms a person can use in order to go, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I think there's one more level to this that we didn't talk about that you and I have been able to tap in from time to time. And I would say live events is where we're able to do this. I would call it coordinated flow where two people with a, or two or more people with a goal or objective or on a trajectory, both or many individuals are in flow together. It's like a jazz band playing together. Mm. They're activating, like they're, they're, they're in that space of flow with each other in a group or collective. It could be two people or it could be more. And now we're starting to see exponential energies unlocked. It's almost woo. Metaphysical. It's weird. <laughs> but I would say like at live events, for example, you get to do that coaching and that teaching that you're talking about that you often will do one-to-one -one with somebody. Now you're doing it live on a stage potentially. And so there's also an audience. It expands maybe the realm of your extroverted feeling or harmony at your 10 year old or tertiary level. There's more people engaged, not just the two of you, but the entire system. And you and I are together doing this as a team. And so it feels even more than just being in flow on my own individually. Hmm. Now that's the first place to start. If you can get to that place by yourself and you're with other people that are able to do that too. I think that's where you know great music bands you know, that's a great metaphor, like a musical band that can play together in real time and come up with music together or play. Mm -hmm. I think that is possible. But 
you have to be able to first, so let's just review. You have to be able to first identify what puts each of your cognitive functions and your personality into flow first. What activities enlighten those? What brings those out? And then how do you get into activities that bring all of them out together in harmony that makes your entire soul sing? And then I think you have the opportunity to find other people doing the same and syncing up with them. And now exponential things can happen in your life and the things you're attuned to as a team. Yeah, well, that's what lights you up for what you always call complex coordination. Yeah. Because now you're merging these energies and now you're on purpose together. And now bigger things can happen. Uh, Imagine you listening right now, you and your partner, your romantic partner, or a really good friend or somebody that's your business partner, you could find flow together as a unit, as a team. Imagine how your world would look. Imagine how many petty disagreements would just fall by the wayside how many goals you could achieve, how many things you can uh, do together, how much fun you can have. I think it's an inspiring idea. Yeah. So uh, you usually say, what do you think? Oh yeah, well, do you feel complete? I, want to <laughs> I make do sure actually. I feel like uh, I think I feel like we laid the track for this concept, and I'm very interested to see what it, like comes up for people who, yeah. or for you, the listener, the person who isn't here. What comes up for you on this one? Yeah. You know, like, uh, like, like what's, I'm, I'm interested in the feedback. So you haven't had a third microphone, but you've been the third person in this conversation. Come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode. You can make a comment, ask a question or share your story. What are the things that put you into flow? Do you know those things? Have you had a moment where it was accidental and you're like, whoa, that was amazing. I felt so amazing. How did that happen? And you're still unpacking it or understanding it. We want to hear from you. Also, if you want to take this concept further, we do have personality type owner's manuals, one for all of the personality types. So for your unique wiring, we talk a little bit more about this idea of getting into flow. How do you do it? What does it look like for your type? What are the obstacles or obstructions to you being able to get into flow for your specific personality type? Because on this on this show, we had to talk more principle-based, right? And the topic and principles of it. What We can get down to the specifics of your type uh, if you go ahead and get one of those owner's manuals. Mm. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave a rating and review for us on iTunes, it helps us out a lot. We also have a video podcast. It's on YouTube. You might be watching us right now. If you enjoyed this episode, you can like, smash that like button, as the kids say, subscribe, and hit the little bell that lets you know when a new episode comes out. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it in all major book retailers. And if you leave a rating and review for us on Amazon or in Goodreads, that also helps us out a lot. And as Joel mentioned, we have owner's manuals that are tailored to your personality type. Now, it's not an owner's manual for that type. It's an owner's manual for you as a human being. And you're using this lens of understanding your Myers-Briggs type to understand how you operate as a person. We don't come with an owner's manual, so we have to design our own. So head over to personalityhacker.com and grab the owner's manual starter for you as a person that's right for you. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker podcast. Mm-hmm.